experience and then hand it over to Joyce. Um, I'm retired from aerospace, retired technical fellow. I've got uh, about 35 plus years uh, developing various optical systems used on the ground, in the air, and in space. Um, I've played various roles throughout my career from research scientist, engineer, and uh, program manager, and also have taught um, a few uh, optical systems engineering courses. Right. And I'm also retired from aerospace with 30 years. I started with a chemistry degree. I started in materials and processes laboratories, uh, specialized in contamination control, and then went on to increasing responsibilities, both in engineering and operations. Uh, got to retire early, so then I worked a commercial winery through Crush. I worked in a tasting room for a few years. I worked in a home wine and winemaking uh, shop, and I installed a couple vineyards. So I was kind of exploring a second career in, in wine. Uh, we both went through the UC Davis wine certificate program and have had uh, been making wine for over 12 years. So um, really want to talk, highlight the benefits of using root cause analysis methods. You know, farming and making wine has been around for a very long time, but yet we still face significant grape growing or winemaking problems. And one of the reasons we thought that or started using these methods that we learned in aerospace in winemaking is the lag time. It's not like you make a product and then if something goes wrong during making it, the next day you can fix it and the next day you make more of the products and you make sure that everything's working. There's a long lag time between processes and it could be a whole year or more where you fi fix a problem, you think you fixed it, you will have to wait a year, and then if it didn't work, then you're waiting another year, et cetera. So these tools can help improve the chances of really getting to the right root cause and getting it corrected. They organize things, prioritize things, a large amount of data. Um, you understand contributing factors and the root cause, and you have a much better chance of solving a problem. And even if you can't fix it, you've come up with um, multiple preventative measures for uh, for the next time and you know the blue box is just to remind us that it's very easy to google something and but you can find more than one problem and more than one solution and you just don't want to have a trial and error approach to your winemaking. So let me uh, uh, talk a little bit about uh, quality first. Um, and uh, quality um, has its own two kinds of characteristics. So one, one is the characteristic that you're looking for in your wine. It might be uh, the nature of the flavor or the aroma or the color. And the other aspect of quality has to do with the degree of excellence or the intensity of some particular attribute. And of course, it can be a combination of these. And, and it's important to think about quality as you're making wine and, and what aspects you want to improve. On the upper right of this chart was somewhat of a uh, humorous uh, little episode we had a, a handful of years ago. We, uh, as home wine makers, we, uh, we like to get independent feedback from expert tasters. And so we submit these to various uh, um, uh, county fairs and other competitions uh, in California, mostly. And uh, one year we got the package back and, and we got looked at, we we're all very happy. Oh, we got a gold medal. Well, it turns out it was a gold medal for the label. And then we looked at the rest of the package. Oh, the wine was mediocre. So uh, it, immediately that was kind of disappointing, but we got a kind of a chuckle out of that. So the wine inside was not that good. And we had we had spent a little time working on the label, but had neglected the wine. Uh, another aspect of when you're thinking about quality is what are your customers or your clients or your uh, um, buyers of your wine, what is their expectation for what they're looking for in a quality product? 
And uh, so that will help guide where you want to steer, where you're going with the wine. Um, and um, as you're thinking about it too, think about proxies or attributes. Uh, break it down a little bit. Like, do you want, in our case, we're, we're looking for feedback and we'd like to get higher uh, quality expert scores, but maybe you want to try to obtain a higher retail uh, price. Um, so uh, think about the aspects. And on the bottom right, is just a little cartoon of a circular flow chart that relates wine quality proxies um, to wine characteristics uh, like sensory attributes, uh, volatile compounds, et cetera. And as you're working through your investigations and over time, you can look for correlations and are they negative or positive? So like, for example, in the vineyard, the longer hang time the fruit has in the vine, the sugar's going up, but the acid is going down. So in one sense, that can be thought of as a negative correlation for longer time on, on the vine. So think about these uh, attributes that you associate with the quality that you're looking for uh, and work to uh, improve those. So uh, a brief chart on problems. Uh, and um, problems come in um, different ways and have different implications. I'm just gonna spend a little bit on this before we get into the methods here uh, so that one can think about uh, the problem and the nature of how much you want to invest into solving it and fixing it. So the first one is, uh, is maybe you, you have an uneasy sense that you're not maintaining the uh, maintenance schedule on your equipment. And the consequence of that can be pretty startling. Uh, you, maybe you think you can get uh, some more time out of this uh, tractor. And I have this kind of humorous picture. We have an old 47 Ford uh, tractor on our, at the bottom of our, our vineyard. And it's got, and I've got this joke here. I can't remember when I checked the oil last. And, it's just a reminder, an interest reminder, uh, pay attention to the maintenance uh, schedule. And another underlying thread throughout this talk is not just solving, finding the root cause and contributing factors, but developing preventive maintenance. So another type of problem is that you know you've got a problem, but you think you might be able to fix it later. And so out of press, you may uh, smell or taste something initially that seems to be too vegetal. And in your mind, you think, well, maybe I can uh, fix this in an EG. Maybe I can mask that with uh, some uh, uh, compounds out of the oak, or oak barrel. But that may not be where you want to be going. And then another, another example of a type of problem uh, is when you, you've got a problem, you realize that, you think you know what you caused it, and you jump to a conclusion, but you make it worse. Uh, and that can exasperate the issue. And as Joyce mentioned earlier, sometimes these things manifest themselves uh, over months, if not years, when they show up the true implications. Uh, and then the last one it, uh, is you've got a problem and you, you don't realize it, and you just proceed off with getting your uh, wine to uh, market. Uh, so to speak. So the key message, understand your problem, the details, and the extent you want to go to uh, fix it. So um, when you encounter a problem, uh, we encourage people to think about developing and writing down, take a moment, write it down in a notebook or something. Uh, what are the observables of your problem? And the, these, this problem statement will become the effect that we're going to be searching for in our cause and effect diagram. So uh, we want to write down the things that we see, evidence, factual things like the what and when, when is what part of the winemaking process, where was it in the field or was it in the winery, and who was involved in this process to, uh, to help uh, guide our investigation. And there's a couple of examples on the right here that we, we identify that we have what variety, what the sugar uh, level was, 
Uh, when that test data was taken, it was a week before, maybe it has changed at this current time, and what block in the vineyard, where did it come from? We have a hillside vineyard, a lot of microclimates, uh, even within our small vineyard, and we can see big differences from uh, the way those grapes are growing, where they're located within the vineyard, and what type of measurement, refractometer in the field versus hydrometer in wine, et cetera. And so there are, uh, it's important here to capture what you know to be true, facts or evidence. Uh, it's kind of fun to speculate, but not now. Right now we're capturing, at this phase, we're capturing the observable conditions of your problem. Okay, um, we have, uh, so we're gonna describe the, probably one of the primary techniques in, the, in our book and it is the cause and effect diagram. It basically starts with causes of problems in, of manufactured or created products. The causes fall into one of six categories. Either it's the processes you used, um, and in, in this example I'm using just uh, rehydrating yeast. Um, so the processes are the step-by-step -step methods, mixing the yeast, adding the juice, et cetera. The materials are the actual constituents. So here it's the yeast, it's the um, water, it's uh, nutrients, et cetera, raw materials. Uh, it could be equipment, um, very simple equipment in this case, but you may be using uh, a bucket that's got a crack or a big spoon with a with that's got a little rust on it or a heating plate to keep it at a constant temperature that's not working very well. Uh, the next category is people. So who performed these processes with these materials and these equipment? Are they trained? Do they have the right skills? Do they pay attention to detail and follow every step? Or did somebody else do it this time? Measurement. These are quantitative measures taken during um, during the activity. It could be the way, it's the weighing of the yeast. Was the scale accurate? It's monitoring the temperature. Was that accurate? And then the environment itself: temperature, cleanliness, humidity, whatever else matters in the category of. of um, So these, this is now what the basic uh, cause and effect diagram looks like. It's affectionately called the fishbone diagram because it kind of looks like bones of a fish. So the head of the fish is where the problem statement gets put that Bruce uh, mentioned. This is what is the effect that we've observed and then all the causes get put onto the applicable bone of the the six major categories. And you separate these out and you drill down and uh, get deeper and deeper. And this is just kind of a generic winemaking one. So the processes are all the different aspects and each of those have, have many more sub-processes of materials, equipment, et cetera. We, we have a chart on each one of these that we can go into in more detail. Okay, so let me talk a little bit about the processes. So uh, we break down from uh, the vineyard to storage of the wine bottle, nine separate processes, growing, harvest, destemming, crushing, fermenting, pressing, aging, and then clarifying, bottling, and storing. And uh, we like to do this uh, for a couple of reasons in this problem-solving world by associating the problem with a certain phase or step in the overall process. Uh, one can think about uh, when that process began and, and when did it end before it transitioned to the next. And there are certain categories of issues or conditions that drive potential risks during those particular processing. And so it helps us at the, at the beginning to focus and expedite our search for possible suspects, suspects knowing which phase it, it occurred. 
And also you can see when you start developing and looking at your records over years, you can start to see trends or changes and they're associated with certain phases of these uh, processes. And there's also each of these have a major detailed breakout of them uh, growing as, as you all know, has, has uh, key aspects that need to occur each month, uh, every few weeks or, or even uh, quicker in the vineyard in order to um, make sure that the, the grapes uh, grow well and ripen to the level that you'd like. So on materials, this was the second group. Uh, we don't break it down into all of the detailed chemical composite components of uh, 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 the tens and hundreds that are within each of these, but we break it down into the to the all important grapes and, uh, and half a dozen uh, characteristic materials within those uh, components within those grapes in the yeast in the nutrients and this allows us to think about uh, though that macro level of uh, uh, material and and is it a quality component entering in it, into a, its phase and so you know we're all looking for a certain uh, sugar and acid level in the grape and we'll determine when to uh, pick in accordance and also we may be driven by other external factors that may drive us to a non-optimal point but we're thinking about uh, a certain elements within those grapes that give us the quality level of that material to make ultimately make the quality wine and then yeast, uh, we, we, predict, we use commercial yeast, uh, different yeast for our different varieties. We grow, uh, uh, I think, five or six of the Bordeaux varietals. And you can also use yeast in the, in the vineyard, natural yeast. It takes a little more time getting the history and, and the pedigree of what you're getting out of the vineyard. But we know a number of uh, winemakers who have been very successful with natural yeast from there to their vineyard. And uh, we are worried about those uh, spoilage yeast. So part of, uh, we try to start with a, um, a uh, strong dominant uh, uh, yeast in our wines. And uh, we also pay attention to nutrients. Yeast, the living organism, it needs food. Uh, and we need, and Throughout the fermentation, we have to make sure that food is sufficient uh, uh, for the yeast still to survive, and as and it needs more to say to stay alcohol uh, resistant as you progress through the uh, fermentation. And uh, and we have we do malolactic on uh, on most of our our wines, and we pay attention to the quality of the. Uh, the bacteria that we use. And of course, there's the, the bottles and the corks who are largely uh, inert. Uh, historically, there may have been issues with cork paint, but that seems to be rare uh, these days. But things like the bottle, we want to pay attention to cleanliness and uh, sanitation of those bottles before we introduce the wine. Then equipment, uh, we all use a lot of equipment to, uh, to go from the vineyard to the uh, bottle. We use a, uh, a small destemmer crusher, uh, which can, breaks the uh, skin to uh, release the juice and a hydraulic uh, uh, press. And we use a number, a number of different containers. Uh, uh, we like to finish in uh, oak barrels and sometimes we do fermentation and some aging in these plastic uh, air breathing uh, containers and also in stainless tanks when we want uh, a little less oak. Uh, um, and then we have a number of carboys and, and we, we need to pay attention when you're using oak barrels. Uh, there are a lot of evaporation and so one needs to top off frequently uh, to make it through 18, 24 months of aging. And then we have uh, uh, a pretty, for a home winemaker shop, I think we have a, a pretty, uh, Joyce, uh, um, she didn't mention, but she ran the materials and process lab at our company for decades. And so we have uh, pretty uh, sophisticated equipment and uh, 
in our in our in our little winery here. But that's all be said, one knows needs to know how to use it and is it is it working properly. And so when you're as I that last chart had the message with all of those that equipment one not only needs to understand how to use it but when and how it might fail and there's different categories of failure that one needs to pay attention to there can be like in, in a, a digital thermometer could lose power and it's just not making the measurement at all but uh, for example in a press different presses have apply different force to uh, squeeze that that final squeezing of the of the skins to get all the juice and the other components and how in free run has had the, the least uh, components. Uh, the first press is going to be introducing more and the second press, depending upon the style you want, maybe you want more additional uh, bitter compounds that might be coming out of the skin. Uh, so, but your press is over multiple years of use can be, um, can be ha start to have a de degraded failure mode. So one needs to pay attention to that and uh, test uh, to understand how it's doing and it's working properly. The next category is people. And the, the key here is, is training of people and that they have the skills. Winemaking uh, can often be part-time or you've got people doing more things. Yes, they run the tasting room, but occasionally they come and do things in the winery. And those people aren't going to be as familiar, you know, if they're not doing processes every day, they're going to forget things. So having them well trained, having them enthusiastic, and really pay attention to detail are the right kinds of people you want involved in the processes. Measurement. Um, so if a measurement is made incorrectly, that's a person that the person did it wrong. So that would fall in the people category. So this category is really about the measurement itself, uh, the calibration of the instrumentation, the accuracy of the measurement. So you don't want to use cheap things uh, that don't have any kind of calibration, uh, unless if it's for a critical measurement, you want to have the, the best kind of. Aid instrumentation you can. You've got to calibrate your pH meter every day and use the right buffers for the ranges that you're measuring. Uh, not the typical four and seven buffers, but use three when you're doing wines and go up to nine when you're doing uh, titration endpoints at 8.2. Um, also, don't expect measurements made with different measurement techniques to match. They don't. They're different they're based on different physics. And so, so a typical one is a hydrometer versus a refractometer. You measure in the field and then you come, and then you pick, and then you come in the lab and geez, this is a different number. So yes, it's going to be different. And you have to understand those differences and make adjustments according. Also many measurements are temperature sensitive. So you've got to do the calibrations or at that temperature or use the correction charts, relative humidity, or, those kind of meters are known to drift. So the, the old fashioned wet dry bulb method is the most accurate. Um, be sure your titration solutions are fresh, everything's clean, and um, degas the wine when, when it's appropriate or, or solid and deal with solid settling out or not as applicable. The environment category for winemaking is, I'm really temperature is the biggest problem, but anything from an environment standpoint would go into this category. We have uh, put those nine uh, process phases in here, and really the yellow highlight are three times when temperature is critical, and they're long periods of time, so that has an impact, but also they're critical the standpoint of, you know, particularly fermentation, if it gets too hot, it can, you can kill your yeast. If it gets too cold, it won't be active. During aging, you really want cool and constant temperature. So looking at temperature data and tracking and 
and controlling temperature is going to be the biggest possible root cause of a problem in this category. Uh, so those are the six main categories. The technique is called the five whys. And when you first encounter a problem, these are probing questions where you ask repeatedly, well, why did that happen? Well, why did that happen? Because the first why might not, it's not likely to be the root cause. So we, we basically, um, in this example, why did the wine get over sulfided? Well, Joe did it. So it's a people problem. Just blame Joe. Might not be Joe. <laughs> well, why did Joe make the mistake? He's didn't remember how to do it. Well, why does he have to remember how to do it? Isn't the procedure written down? Is it written in such a way that Joe or everyone does it exactly the same way? And are we all trained? And we don't do it very often. So the more, more detail in, in the procedure, the more, the less likely you're going to have a problem. So you're not, it's not about blaming who did it. It's more about why did that happen? And and get to the real deeper root cause. So one, in the fishbone diagram, once you've got it all, you have kind of been brainstorming and opening your mind to all the potential root causes of this problem you have. Everything to consider. Now you've got to disposition all those potential problems and to get to the real problem real causes and so the key is to do a lot of data gathering looking at notebooks e-records talking to people everyone participates in this and you're looking for patterns or a unique condition well the problem only seems to happen when we use a certain tank or when we do this when a certain person does the method or um, on cold nights or whatever the situation is you're digging deeper, you're looking for anomalies, you're looking for outline. You have to think like a detective. And so you're, you're gathering objective evidence, for each of your potential root causes, to prove that either it's not or it is a likely cause of the problem. So you just position things to say, no, it can't be this because the records show X. You may be able to take corrective action on your problem without really finding it, or you may find that there's two and you really don't have enough information to pin it down to one. But even having two, you can take actions on both of those. And so obviously bottom line is the more records you have, the more data and information and just recording of activities, the more likely you're gonna find something now that happened last year and you're not going to rely on people's memories. So uh, let me spend a little more time on, on the measurement overall program. And we encourage um, making measurements from, uh, from in the field, in, in the vineyard, making uh, chemi chemical measurements of the juice and wine and sensory measurements. Uh, we'd like it's it provides a large span of uh, data that you can go back at and, and check and analyze. Are there any inflection points or trends or, or off nominal conditions? So uh, we have a weather station in our, in our vineyard, which is uh, monitoring a number of uh, weather conditions and some soil moisture sensors. To, uh, keep us cognizant of uh, how much water is in the ground. We do drip irrigate. Uh, we make uh, chemistry measurements of the uh, of the juice and the and the wine to give us uh, uh, data points on what's the uh, the major components of pH, acidity, and uh, sugar uh, in the wine and uh, juice. And then we also uh, do our own sensory evaluation. Uh, we prefer, we like, there are a number of different scales or techniques to do this. Uh, and we like the 20 point uh, scale that was uh, developed uh, from Davis uh, a while back. And it, it breaks down the, the sensory characteristics in the, the visual and the 
um, the aromas and the various uh, textures and, and taste components in it. And we keep track of, of our impression of the wine. And we also submit our wines to independent uh, judges to evaluate and give us uh, feedback and take that feedback to heart and say, oh, we're not improving a certain uh, vegetal characteristics. How might we change or, or fix that problem? So uh, thorough measurements program helps provide data to solve problems. So in, in, and on that note, this happens to be a, a volatile acidity uh, graph here on the right. It's got VA gram per liter on the y-axis. And then it has on the x-axis the sequential nine phases and there there are I think four vintages here that have progression of how to VA change from uh, harvest uh, to the uh, finished bottle and the things that we're looking for over different vintages or the vintage is was there an inflection point or a significant change and then that could be a uh, significant increase uh, like the one that's shown that steps up from a uh, crush uh, or after press can be an indicator. A big change occurred there, something uh, was introduced or something uh, we need to investigate, an unwanted micro or something. Uh, so it orients us where to look uh, in investigation. And, um, and then uh, the best of the best and worst of the worst method is another technique that we uh, employ kind of at the, towards the beginning of a problem investigation. And this helps us, uh, helps us to um, narrow all of the poss possibilities. We may have many contributing factors that we may have many suspects, but it, and we don't have the time and resources to go after them all. So if we're fortunate enough to have multiple vintages that we can look at, or even if you have only one vintage multiple in, in, in aerospace, we'd have complex systems and we'd have subsystems or components uh, or piece part materials. Uh, you can break it down to get to give an idea uh, what is the best finished product with the quality attributes uh, and compare that with another finished product that is really the worst of its group and look for patterns in the components like the materials. Uh, this illustration on the left has got this uh, egg-shaped oval, which is kind of a cartoon of overall wine quality. On the right-hand side is a smaller oval with the best quality. Then one inside that, best of the best. Then on the left-hand side, there's the worst quality. And inside that, the worst of the worst. And in the middle are, are these ones that are somewhere in, the bet in between. We don't have all of the tools or techniques to isolate every one. So it's good if you could set aside the ones that are kind of in between and then look for a pattern in the really the best wine that you've got and the worst wine that's related. And in this case, we have uh, four vintages, which are represented by those four up arrows. And uh, vineyard two is producing, uh, provided the grapes for the somewhere in between and the best of the best wine. Vineyard one provided the grapes for the worst, the worst wine and somewhere in between we're able to um, drop out the somewhere in between, look for the big contrast, and, and we can see that a likely suspect of this is the vineyard or the grape source. So something's going on with the uh, growing uh, in the harvesting or the harvesting of those grapes. Uh, there's another technique called Kempner Traeger method, and it is used for Decision making. And um, in this example, we're looking for, uh, we've got three different options across the top of how to improve the color of our wine. One option might be a cold maceration, 
uh, before fermentation. Another might be slow down the fermentation uh, through yeast selection to give more time on the skins. And then a third one might be cool down the fermentation for to, uh, to have a slower fermentation to get more, more time on the skins. So, and we, what we do is we consider our, what are the important attributes? How's the resulting quality of each of these techniques? How, uh, the schedule to implement each of this, these techniques? to implement each of these techniques and maybe the risk of implementing these techniques. But your attributes you decide on and you even give them a weight of what's, which one's the most important, which one's the least important. And, and so in some years, in for some, some wineries, schedule is everything. I mean, others cost, I, I don't have any money, so it's gotta be the low cost option. So um, what you do is, you weigh the effectiveness of each, you score the effectiveness of each of the three options against the, the attributes, uh, your, your criteria. And then you multiply it by the weight that you gave, and then you sum it up, I'm sorry, um, sum it up and look for the high score. And it kind of takes the emotion or the, the um, preconceived ideas uh, particularly if you have different people leaning towards a different option and you systematically do it and, and score it and wait and see the results and it gives you the, really the best decision for the circumstance. Um, so we've, we've thrown a lot of different methods out at you and this kind of just summarizes uh, making sure you define what your quality goals are is really important. Try using the five whys as a simple way to get to the deeper issues. The cause and effect diagram and its analysis gives you a very systematic, methodical method for identifying potential causes and then dispositioning them to get the right one. The best of the best and worst of the worst kind of sorts out the, the extremes and you're able to see what always works and what never works. <laughs> Kempner Trago analysis gives you that rational approach for making decisions, and you might apply it after you, your cause and effect or your, your best and worst methods give you some options. And then, of course, in every case, application of preventative man, don't just correct the problem this time, employ preventative measures so that it never comes back. So um, we've gotten um, a lot of material here, and um, we've gotten a, a number of questions about, well, does this, do these systematic methods really work? And so we've added this, uh, this chart here, uh, and it's kind of fun for us, and uh, we, we like to think of it as answering that question, yes, they have worked for us, and what we have here is on the y-axis is this 20-point uh, scale, and uh, on the uh, uh, x-axis is various vintages starting from 2012 up through 2018 on this chart. And uh, what it shows us that when we were in the 2012, 13, 14 uh, days, we were making problems and, uh, and we had challenges. We, we worked hard to apply these systematic methods to uh, solve them and develop more preventive measures. And sure enough, the uh, scores started to rise. So in 2016 and in 2017 and 18, our state cabs uh, did get up into the uh, gold medal uh, range in the 18 to 20 point scale range. Uh, and so we're very happy about that. And uh, and also, we added this one box up at the upper top. In 2018, um, we had some uh, issues with our Merlot, so we ended up picking some uh, Merlot grapes from uh, Sonoma and applying our same vinification winemaking process. And sure enough, the, the 2018 Sonoma Merlot did get a uh, double gold. So 
we were happy happy about that. So this kind of uh, somewhat anecdotal evidence is not 100% conclusive, but we like to think it's highly likely that they're effective. So thank you very much. Uh, we appreciate the time. Uh, if you like the material or, or some of it, uh, please check out our book. Uh, there are more details and scenarios and explanation of implementation in the book and find it on Amazon or maybe even a library near you or Springer. <laughs> Thanks, thank you for your time. And we'll, we'll take any questions now. Well, thank you very much um, for your presentation. So yeah, if um, any of the attendees have any qu any questions at this time, please type them in the chat box or Q&A box. Um, we're happy to answer them. You, you can hear me, right? Yeah, okay. Um, I just wanted to say, I really like how structured your approach is and how logical it appeals to me um, a lot. And um, I also wanted to make a comment about having wines evaluated by outside people, you know, sending your wines out to be tasted and, 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 and tried by, by, by people and actually accepting the feedback. Um, I find that many times it's hard to accept negative feedback as a winemaker. Um, it's a matter of pride and, um, and I, I, I really encourage everyone to do so um, and to keep an open mind and, and to listen to what other, you know, other people have to say because uh, usually it's good information and um, it, it can be very helpful. Hmm. So any questions at this point? Questions, comments? Just a comment from Jim that he loves the lean um, Six Sigma approach and thanks for the presentation. Yeah, we figured we did it so much at work. Why, why aren't we applying it to this winemaking? Why are we just doing a trial and error approach? Or doing what, what often happens, it's very easy to just do the most common cause of a problem. Well, you might not have the most common cause and you're gonna, you're gonna fix the most common cause and wait a whole year before you find out if it really works and then it doesn't so you you have the same problem for another year and that isn't that isn't what you want to do and, uh, all right go ahead i was just going to add uh, on to dr b's comment about getting independent uh assessments uh you know we have, uh, one has one's own personal bias for the style and type of wine, um, but it is, and, and we have uh, lots of friends that have tasted our wine, friends and family, and often you, we've gotten, oh, that's so nice. Uh, um, but it, it's, it's not really uh, necessarily uh, a critical feedback of are there certain types of flaws or off elements and so uh, it took um, it's tough reading some of the feedback uh, when you get it um, and you question but uh, it is uh, very valuable to uh, take it to heart and uh, we found uh, we try to actually improve those uh, criticisms that we get of the, of the wine over uh, next couple of vintages mm -hmm. All right, well, I don't see any questions, any yeah, further questions. Um, comment from uh, Richard, good presentation. Thank you. Um, so if there, if there are no further questions, I, I'm just going to say thank you very much for taking the time to be here with us today. Thank you to all the um, attendees who watched the webinar. Um, again, please, please um, fill out the survey that's going to pop up. It only takes one or two minutes tops and it's really helpful for me. And with that, I wish you all a good day and I will see you next time. Thanks again. Thank Bye. you Thank very you. much. Bye-bye.